Hey, Dan, what kind of day is it? It's a new day. It is a new day. Has anybody been nice to you lately? Yes. I'm yes. sure they're always nice to you, but I'm thinking strangers who maybe let you out of the parking lot or into traffic. Into or traffic. Opened a door. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Well, there was a study done about 10 years ago, and one of the things they said, it was done at Notre Dame, one of the things they said was that if people are nice to you, you can thank your religion. <laughs> Kind of good to know, isn't it? Yeah, it but is. what they discovered was that people who are religious are three to four times more likely to be involved in their community and just be nicer. And the interesting thing was it wasn't because they're afraid God will be angry if they're not nice or they're trying to get into heaven when they die. Punch my ticket. <laughs> Punch my ticket. Nope, <laughs> nope. It's because of the community. They said what they discovered was that if somebody from your religious community asks you to do something, you're way more likely to say yes than if somebody from outside the community asks you. Okay. And so being religious just makes us nicer. Well, we're starting a whole new series today where we're going to look at some of the predominant religions in our world and sort of compare and contrast them with who we are as Christians. But to start, I think we need to answer one question. Why am I a Christian? <laughs> uh, lots of reasons. We'll take a look at it and see where we come out. So you ready to go? I am. All right, let's start it. The year that um, our oldest son Charles was his first year at Black Hill State, we were planning a trip out to the Black Hills to my father's house to spend Thanksgiving weekend. My sister was coming. My brother, of course, lived in the same town, so it was going to be a big family thing. So we're driving along in our suburban from Sioux Falls. Charles was going to drive up independently, you know, from Spearfish, and going along, and we're like, I don't know, 40 miles outside of Kadoka. And if you've ever driven from Sioux Falls to Rapid City on I-90, you know there's a whole lot of nothing out there and you know this is Wednesday night you know it's getting dark you know getting a little later and I'm driving along and then all of a sudden everything just stops on the suburban and I managed to get to the side of the road nothing's working pop the hood and look nothing is working at all so I get on my phone and call our insurance you know hey we need a tow and the person I was talking to obviously was like from a call center, probably in a large metropolitan area. And she said, okay, ma'am, we'll get you some help immediately. I just need to know what the closest intersection is. And I'm like, intersection? I'm like, I'm on Interstate 90, you know, just outside of Kadoka. She's like, no, no, we, I have to put in the closest intersection first and then we'll get to what city you're in and I'm like you know there's no intersection I'm in I-90 there's like fence posts and there's I can tell you the mile marker and she's like no no just the closest intersection and I and I was getting frustrated because obviously this woman had not been to South Dakota on I-90 any time in her life she had no idea that there was a lot of cities scattered about but nothing close and I was getting frustrated and I could tell she was getting frustrated too and I just wanted to tell her look at a map of South Dakota and just find I-90 and the, the spot furthest away from anything is probably where we're at. I think a lot of times when we're trying to understand God's love we're like that poor woman in that metropolitan area that has no clue about God's love. We have no clue about God's love, just like she had no clue about South Dakota, the barrenness, the openness, the lack of buildings and cities. Until she was actually in my same spot on I-90 looking at the absolute nothingness around me she'd have no idea of what of my location and just like that until we can give love away it's only then that we can begin to understand the tiniest bit of God's love for us so if we want to understand God's love we've got to give God's love away. And that's our challenge. 
Our scripture today comes from the book of Ephesians, one of Paul's letters. Um, I'm beginning in the third chapter, going to read the first 12 verses. And as you know, most of the books of our New Testament are letters from a man named Paul. And in this section, he's been advising the Christians in Ephesus on how to live their lives. But at this point, he's explaining to them why he's a Christian. It's his why I'm a Christian statement. Let's listen for God's word. When I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming, by the way, that you know God gave me the special responsibility of, expen of extending his grace to you Gentiles, as I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read what I've written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his Spirit he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe in the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I've been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord, because Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. May God bless us with understanding for these words. So the question is, who are you? Have you ever thought about that? Pondered it a little bit? Who are you? You know, philosophers have been debating this for a whole long time. They think deep thoughts and write real deep things about it. The 17th century French philosopher René Descartes, um, probably the most famous thing he ever said were three words, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. There's an old joke. Um, Descartes walked into a bar one day, ordered a drink, sat down and drank it. When he'd finished his drink, the bartender came up and asked if he'd like another. He thought for a minute and said, no, nah, I think not. And he disappeared. Bada dump bump. I think therefore I am. I think they're not there. Uh, I guess you had to be there. Who are you? And, and maybe the most important, more important question is not just about who I am, but why have I made this choice to be a follower of Jesus, to be a Christian? You know, I, there are a number of reasons that I hear bandied about that are not really reasons to follow Jesus. Um, the first one is not a reason. I would call material success. You hear this all the time. It, it's really sort of a manipulation of Old Testament Deuteronomic theology. That theology said that God rewards faithful people and fun, punishes unfaithful people. But really it was blown up in the book of Job. Remember that book? There was a faithful guy named Job and all these terrible things kept happening to him and his friends kept saying, well, you must have sinned. You must have done something to anger God. And he kept proclaiming his innocence and they kept saying, you need to look deeper at your life. And really, he was innocent. And in the end, he gets no answer even from God why all this thing is happening to him. And really, it's a parable that blows up that kind of thinking that God simply rewards faithful people. In other words, if things are going well, it must be because you're faithful and punishes unfaithful. And if you're not having success, well, then it must be because you're unsuccessful, because you're unfaithful. Back in the 18th, 19th century, religious leaders began to use this to manipulate people. You know, they were saying, if you want God's blessing, in terms of getting lots of material stuff, then you need to give more to the church. 
really, uh, Oral Roberts worked that to perfection beginning about 1945. And, and by the time I was coming through seminary in the early 80s, it had developed into what was called seed faith. And it was a manipulation of Jesus' parable of the sower. Remember, there was a sower, and he went out to sow seeds, and some of it fell on rocks, and some of it fell among thistles, but some of it fell on good soil, and that produced a hundred times more. And manipulative clergy would come along and tell their people, if you give money to this ministry, God will reward you with a hundred times as much. In other words, if you give a thousand dollars to church, God will give you a hundred thousand dollars. If you give ten thousand dollars, well, God will make you a millionaire. Now, the caveat on all that was about being patient because the reward came in God's time, not on our time, or... If the reward never came, it was because you somehow had become unfaithful. It was a way to manipulate people. The other side of that is about, about success. You know, and we see this all the time. People who are successful always praise God for giving them success, but when they're not so successful, somehow God never comes into it. You know, if you're watching this now, we're coming to the end of the Olympic Games, and, and so often I've seen this, in, especially in sporting events, where an athlete will win a championship or even just win a game, and afterwards there'll be an interview, and the athlete will come up and say, I want to thank God for blessing me with this victory or blessing me with the strength to win, something like that. And I understand they're trying to give God credit for the good things that happen in their life, but nobody ever seems to say, you know, God blessed me with this, which means God chose me over the people who lost, and it never seems like people in second place come in and say, I want to thank God for not allowing me to win a victory today. Yeah, we never say that part. Material success is not a reason to follow Jesus because it doesn't come that way. Another bad reason is, is I just call it fire insurance. I want to make sure I go to, to heaven when I die. There was another philosopher named Pascal, and, and he was famous for it. It's called Pascal's Wager. And, and he said either Jesus is the Messiah or he isn't the Messiah. And you have to decide either you're going to commit to him or you're not going to commit to him. And, and then there were four possible outcomes. You know, if Jesus is the Messiah and you commit to him, you've gained everything. If Jesus is the Messiah and you don't commit to him, you've lost everything. If Jesus is not the Messiah and you commit to him, well, you haven't lost anything. And if Jesus is not the Messiah and you don't commit to him, you haven't lost anything either. But you don't lose anything by committing to him. And if you don't commit to him, you might lose everything. So you should probably commit to him. The problem with that is that's not faith. That's just fire insurance. And, and the other problem, as one prominent atheist pointed out, what if Muhammad or one of the other religious leaders was right and Jesus wasn't the Messiah, then by committing to Jesus, you might lose everything and the whole thing just falls apart. Those are not reasons to follow Jesus. And then there are some what I call poor reasons. One of those is I was smart enough to be born into a Christian culture. You know, if you were born in the United States, it means you were born in a place that's predominantly Christian. Had I been born in Iraq or even Indonesia, the likelihood is I'd be a Muslim today because that's how I would have been raised. Or I was born, even more important, into a Christian family. I mean, I grew up in the church. My mom and dad would take me to Sunday school and while I was in Sunday school, they'd go across the street to the Franklin Hotel to have coffee with their friends, and most Sundays we'd go to church, and I just grew up there. So being a Christian was a natural thing. The problem with that is what we become, if that's all we have, is called cultural Christians. George Barna is a Christian researcher, and, and back in the 80s, um, he did this exhaustive study of people who claim for themselves the title born-again Christian. 
because his thinking was those who say they're born again Christians usually are more committed than the average Christian and he wanted to study them and their lifestyles and the results of his study came out in a book in 1990 called the frog and the kettle you remember that myth that isn't actually true that if you put a frog in a kettle of water and slowly heat it up the frog will just stay there until it boils to death uh, that's not true when the water gets hot the frog jumps out but it was thought because frogs are cold-blooded that they wouldn't notice the difference but what Barna was trying to say is in his study looking at the lifestyles of those who claim the title born-again Christian there was no distinguishable difference between them and everybody else in society they were just as likely to lie and steal and cheat as anybody else in fact one of the things he discovered was the divorce rate amongst the born-again Christians was actually higher than the national average that being a Christian didn't seem to have any effect on their lives and his book was a condemnation of the church that we've allowed people to be cultural Christians and and really what it's led to is the modern atheist movement if you go around do a survey in the United States today you know what the largest religious category is none none it's the only category that's truly growing more and more people are moving away from religion the modern atheist movement was really started by a guy named Bertrand Russell back in 1927 he gave a series of lectures he called why I'm not a Christian and it became a book published that year and and in it he goes through the proofs that he heard Christians trying to use to prove the existence of God and disputed each and every one of them you know there's the idea of first cause that we live in a creation so there must have been a creator what happened you know you can go ahead and believe in the Big Bang Theory but what was there before the Big Bang? If you ask a scientist, the scientist will simply say, we don't know, but we have good people looking into it. If you ask a Christian, they'll say, well, it's God. And Bertrand Russell says the problem with that is, what was there before God? Where did God come from? And usually our response is, well, God was always there. And he said, I can say the same thing about matter. It doesn't make a good argument. Um, the idea of design. We live in a world that's designed perfectly for human existence. God created the universe so that you and I could live here comfortably. Well, the problem with that is, so far, this is the only place we can live in the universe. If you leave the planet Earth, the universe will kill you in an instant. And the question is, was this world designed the perfect tilt of the earth on its axis, the perfect distance from the sun, the perfect atmosphere around the planet, the perfect amount of gravity, all of those things that work together, were they designed so that we could exist? Or are we just the outcome of what happened? And we can't answer that. Neil deGrasse Tyson has often said, if you have to try and prove God, you have no faith. That's not faith, that's proof. And there is no proof for something like that. So why be a Christian? Why are you a Christian? That's why I pulled this up. Paul. Paul, who was probably the most influential Christian, except for Jesus, in the history of our faith. He took the, the gospel, the good news, to more places than anybody else. More people became Christians because of Paul than anybody else. Remember, <laughs> Jesus only got 12. Well, actually, not even that good. He only got 11. Paul took it to the masses. And he says, here's why I'm a Christian. When I think of all this, he says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the benefit of of you Gentiles Paul felt he was called by God and if you remember his story he was a Pharisee he was a leader of the Jewish community and he began by persecuting Christians because he felt that these Christians these newfound weird religious people were pulling folks away from God and so he went around not just persecuting but having people killed 
for their faith until he had his own meeting with the risen Christ. And at that point, he became a convert and he felt like he was called by God. You know, for many of us, we don't have a dramatic thing. If you remember Paul's story, is on the donkey on the road to Damascus and a bright light comes and it blinds him and knocks him off his donkey and he hears the voice of God saying, why are you persecuting my son? And, and on and on and on. But they took him into town and he was cared for by a Christian. And I think more than the light, more than the voice. It was that care that won him over. He had a reputation. Everybody knew who he was, and yet this man was willing to risk his life to care for someone who was in need. And it touched Paul deeply. Paul also believed that there's a meaning of my life beyond my circumstances. He says, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles. In the beginning of the church, there was this question. Did you have to become a Jew before you could become a Christian? Jesus was a Jew. He never called for a new faith. And so it was this dramatic, could Gentiles, really pagans, get close to God? And Paul said the answer to that was yes. And he spent his life on behalf of somebody else. Here's my struggle today, because I hear a lot of Christians who claim the idea, I have personal freedom, I have rights. Hear Paul again, I'm a prisoner. And it wasn't just that he was sitting in a Roman prison cell, no. I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Becoming a, a Christian, becoming a follower of Jesus means we give up all that for the benefit of Jesus, for the benefit of the people around us. He said, I'm a Christian because I believe in God's plan for the world. He called it a mystery. Jesus called it the kingdom of God, a new way of living every single day in which we focus outside of ourselves. In this church, we have a creed that we say every week. We use it at the end of these broadcasts. And every time it starts with the words, it's not about me. Now, I have to tell you, when I wrote that creed, I blatantly stole that line from Rick Warren. In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, sold over 35 million copies, one of the greatest bestsellers of all time. He begins it that way. And I remember when I read that book and that line stuck out at me. There it is. There it is. There's the struggle of being a follower of Jesus. It's not about me. That's why things like material success don't work, because that's really about me. That's about trying to get God's blessing for me. That's why being growing up simply in a Christian culture or a Christian family doesn't actually do it, because it's still about what's good for me. And Paul said, no, there's a way of living that Jesus taught. Now remember, he came and said, I have come that you might have life in abundance. And we sort of take that to mean an abundance of stuff. God wants me to be rich. God wants me to have all the toys that I want. And yet, the same Jesus said, blessed are the poor. And four verses later in Luke said, woe to you who are rich. And when the young ruler came and said, what do I have to do to enter the kingdom? Jesus replied by saying, follow the rules. And the, the young man said, but I've been following the rules all my life. What else do I need to do? And Jesus said, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have. Give the money to the poor. And then come follow me. And the story ends with the young man walking away sadly because he had a lot of stuff. It's been said, this is Bertrand Russell again. He says, Christ taught that you should give your goods to the poor, that you should not fight ever, that you should not go to church, that you should not punish adultery. Neither Catholics nor Protestants have shown any strong desire to follow his teachings in any of these respects. Except Paul did. Because he, he understood, I've been called to be a servant. A servant of Christ, which means a servant of to the people around us. And it makes a difference. 
You know, we're in the midst of a pandemic right now, and one of the things that just brings me pain, I heard a, a minister from um, Tennessee the other day proclaiming to his congregation, yelling out that nobody should wear a mask, that nobody should get vaccinated, even though those are the two things that can protect the people around us from this disease. Why get vaccinated? It's not so much to protect me, it's to protect the people I love and the people that I don't even know. And that's what Jesus said. How did, if this is this hard, how did Christianity grow from 11 people in four centuries to become the predominant faith of the entire world, which it still is today? Over a third of the people in this world claim the title Christian. It wasn't so in the beginning. And really it begins with a guy named Cyprian who lived in Carthage in the middle of the third century. In his middle age, Cyprian was converted, became a follower of Jesus, and shortly thereafter was named the Bishop of Carthage. Carthage was the political, cultural, economic center of the province of Africa, part of the Roman Empire. And at that time, less than 1% of the people in the Roman Empire were followers of Jesus. After, Car after Cyprian became the bishop, the plague entered. Sound familiar? He called his people to hear a sermon. The plague, historians tell us, was probably a form of Ebola. And if you know anything about Ebola, it's terribly infectious. It spread through contact with bodily fluids. And what Ebola does to the human body is kind of a, a, the worst of the flu symptoms, kind of flu on steroids that makes people throw up and gives them diarrhea to the point where they become so dehydrated that their liver and kidneys eventually shut down. And this whole process only takes a couple of weeks. And so when that would enter a community, what would happen? Everybody would flee. They knew that it was being uh, spread from one person to the next. So if you knew somebody that had it, the one thing you wanted to do was stay as far away from that person as you possibly could. And Cyprian called the Christian community in Carthage together to give this sermon, you will not run away. You will stay here and take care of the people and trust God to take care of you. I'm sure a lot of them died, but they all stayed. And what, here's what people saw was in the midst of this plague, there was only one group that was willing to stay and help out those who were sick. Because really the way you helped them was to keep giving them something to drink, to keep them hydrated so their liver and kidneys wouldn't, fun wouldn't shut down until their bodies could fight off this deadly disease. They stayed. And in less than 100 years, the Christian community had grown from less than 1% of the, of the Roman Empire to more than 10% of the Roman Empire until it would have to be, because it couldn't be resisted anymore, it would have to be proclaimed the national religion of the Roman Empire. Why? Because the Christians cared for others. Why be a Christian? because it gives us the opportunity to give ourselves away. And that may not seem like the easiest thing to do, but here's what Jesus said. This is the life that's the life of abundance. Why? Not because you collect stuff, not because you get lots of glory, but because you get closer to God. Because this is love, and love is who God is. The question is, do we have the faith? By faith, I don't mean belief in things about Jesus. Do we trust Jesus enough to live like him? Because it will bring peace and hope and joy. That's the abundance that Jesus brought us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for all the things that you give us, but mostly we thank you for those opportunities that we have to commit ourselves to you and to the people around us. Lord, we truly want to live the best kind of life. We want a life that's satisfying. We want a life that's filled with joy. Give us the courage to follow you every single day. We pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'm going to invite you, as we always do, to say the New Day Creed with me. Let's read it together. It's not about me. I give myself freely and totally to God, that I may be used for the building of God's kingdom, for the care of God's world, to love God's children, all of God's children, even those who are not like me, even those who do not like me, that God's kingdom might become real and I might be blessed and be made complete. Well, my friends, being a Christian is not easy, but it is good. And in the next few weeks, we'll uh, sit down and discover how it compares to some of the other major religions in our world today. But I think you'll find this is the way to find abundance. So until we meet again, may God's blessing be with you all. Amen.